Good morning, everyone, and welcome. <clears throat> Good morning, church. We're glad to have you here with us today. Um, thanks for uh, choosing to come and join us here in the room or uh, wherever you might be dialing in from this morning. Uh, we're glad you've chosen to join us uh, to make and strengthen life-changing connections with Jesus, with his family, and with the world. If there's anything we can do to be a blessing to you and your family, please let us know. We'd like to do whatever we can. Uh, so if you contact uh, me or one of the elders, uh, some other leader, somebody who looks like they know what they're doing, just grab a hold of them and let them know what you need. We'll, we'll work it out. Uh, let me go through a few things. Um, there is uh, quite a bit of information in the bulletin this week about upcoming events, um, so be sure to pick up one of those uh, uh, this morning. But let me remind you that if you're part of our leadership team, elders, trustees, ministry leaders, staff, uh, there is a meeting uh, in the large classroom back here at noon today. Uh, hopefully, whoever was supposed to bring lunch remembered. We'll, we'll see. Okay. Uh, I'm, I need to remind you that uh, next Sunday, the 30th, is the, um, the baseball game and picnic at Lindquist uh, stadium uh, to watch the Raptors. The picnic runs from 1230 to game time at 2. If you have not registered for that yet, today is the day. If you have any questions, you can see Sue Johnson, who is waving wildly. <clears throat> uh, tickets are $17 for adults. Children are $11. That's all you can eat. It'll be a beautiful day. Um, so uh, get signed up for that. Um, I'm going to be out of the office for the next four weeks. It's kind of loafing, not doing anything uh, for a while uh, during my recovery. Um, so if you have any needs uh, while I'm gone, if you would contact one of our elders, Ed Binkley or Bobby Brown, who is in the back, John Luft, uh, Ken Pink, and Scott Wheeler, uh, they would love to help you out however, uh, however they can. <clears throat> Again, uh, be sure to read through the bulletin. Uh, there's also the electronic newsletter that comes out each week that will continue even in my absence. Um, you can sign up for that through one of the connection cards in the chair pocket or through a link on our website. Uh, and now... You're in the totally wrong spot. Good morning. Um, I wanted to uh, take a second. Um, my name's Stacy Sayers, if you don't know me. Um, so I am in charge of missions and outreach, and one of the things we've tried to do, if you haven't noticed it this year, is every month we've been trying to highlight one of our missions. We have 11 missions that we support. Um, our tithing money goes in to support the church, and of that money, then um, I think we're at 11% now. Our, our money um, then goes to support each of our missions. So each month we've been trying to give a little more of a highlight. So you've actually had speakers so far this year from multiple of our missions. This one, uh, we don't have a local one, so we're going to play a video for you. And after this is done, James can come back up. But I will tell you, um, out on the missions table, we have some new, uh, new materials for them if you want to learn more about them. There's also a letter. They're going through lots of changes down there. If you've been to AICM before, um, they, used to be, uh, they used to do funding one way, and they're trying to do it a different way. So lots of changes there if, you, uh, if you're interested in it. Um, it is, uh, there is more information there, and we may talk about seeing if we can go down in the fall maybe for a mission trip. Hello, Roy Christian Church. My name is Jeff Klein. I am the Executive Director at the American Indian Christian Mission, Sholo, Arizona. We are one of the uh, missions that you faithfully support. Um, at American Indian Christian Mission, we do basically three things. Um, number one um, focus is the school. We have a Christian school, a Christian boarding school for Native American children. And so they do live with us throughout the week. We do send them home on the weekends and pick them up um, Sunday evenings. Um, I'm currently standing in one of the student dorms, one of the girl dorms, as you can see behind me, um, doing the recording, and uh, the, the students are all in school today, so very quiet in the dorm, which is abnormal. And, uh, but uh, our, our vision for the kids are to give them a good education, and we also are discipling them unto the Lord. 
Um, and in the dorms, we um, provide all of their um, the care that they would need, physical, emotional, spiritual care in the dorms, and trying to help them grow in Christ. And our goal is for them to um, become well-educated and also to be um, Christians and that they'd be able to live for Christ all their life um, so that our students can become the change makers in their communities and they can also be the change makers in their families so that they can break free from some of the destructive cycles that uh, their families may be in. So that is our long-term focus um, with the mission. And then the second thing that we do is we work directly with the families of these students and we are in their homes and we are praying with them and we are bringing the gospel of hope into the home also um, in hopes that the whole home would receive Christ as a unit. And, uh, but we also um, are, we provide other needs, um, physical needs that the families might need and, uh, and just um, other training or anything that they, that they might need. Um, that, is, that is the second thing that we do is working directly with our families of our students. And the third thing we do is um, just basically community outreach through Blue Bus Ministry on the reservation. We do most of that through the summer and uh, we do uh, basically it's street ministry where we're doing um, curbside vacation Bible school with students or with children and uh, we are evangelizing the community that way and then we also are working with the families through events where we'll use a local church as a location and we'll set up um, a, a Bible school there and uh, invite the parents and we have uh, a meal and, and try to bring the whole family unit in so that we can um, minister to them also evangelize them and uh, this also gives us a chance to connect communities with their local church in their neighborhoods and we can introduce um, some of the families to uh, to the pastor of that neighborhood and if they need help they would know who to call and, and who to connect and try to get some connection going there and also the pastor gets to know the people in that community a little better and so that that's the third thing that we do and in all those things that we do it's all to um, to make to expand God's kingdom to make it bigger and uh, and so that um, we can give the Native American community um, the gospel of hope for them to be able to live um, for Christ forever and that they would become forever brothers and sisters along with us. And uh, we thank you so much for your support in our efforts in doing that. And we hope that uh, maybe you guys will be able to send the team out soon to come visit us and to do some of this ministry with us. Thank you very much, and we will talk to you soon. Thank you. Bye. Uh, we've had a long relationship with AICM. Uh, actually, in my first ministry, uh, the church I served also uh, had had a long relationship with AICM. I've been there a number of times and would love to go back uh, and take a bunch of you to go and do just what he was talking about, um, to do some real ministry uh, there. So uh, we do want to pray uh, for those friends in Sholo, Arizona, uh, as they uh, hold out God's hope. Um, We've had a few other prayer requests uh, come in this last week as well. Um, let me go over those uh, quickly. Uh, Carrie Sarter's sister-in-law, Linda, is suffering with kidney stones and infections going along with that. Uh, she'd appreciate your prayers. Uh, my son, Cole, and his uh, friend, Caleb Hossebrook, were in an ATV accident on Wednesday. Cole is scratched and scuffed. Uh, Caleb got to go to the hospital uh, where he was there for three days uh, and had surgery for a broken shoulder and, you know, several other uh, fractures uh, in lots of places. Uh, the Hossabrooks are flying back to Minnesota on Wednesday. Uh, they'd appreciate your prayers. Tomorrow is my surgery at Ogden Regional Medical Center. Uh, Amber Bennett is... Uh, scheduled for a total hysterectomy this Wednesday at McKD Hospital. Uh, and then um, today, a group of high school students who are not in the room because they're back together uh, will start a week of camp uh, in Fairfield. Uh, that list is Austin and Brighton Christensen, uh, Cambry, Kiri, uh, Kira and Leah Dixon, uh, Kirsten Hill, Lila Hendricks, and Cora Sayers. So I don't, I didn't do the math real quick there, but it's a lot. Um, uh, Jen Hill and Cody Gwynn are going to drive them up uh, to, uh, to the camp today. 
Uh, it's a long, long round, uh, round trip, so we'll be praying for them as they go, uh, for safe travel and for a great experience for all of our campers. Uh, we want them to come back different, changed, um, challenged uh, by, by God's Holy Spirit. Uh, let's take a minute to pray about these things uh, and some uh, other issues as well. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, we thank you for the chance to be together this morning for all of the good that you have done for us. Um, we, uh, we've sung a few songs this morning about our trust in you. We have full faith and assurance that you will always be with us, that you will take good care of us, uh, and that um, you will fulfill your promises to us. Uh, we ask, Lord, that you would uh, put your uh, strong, loving hands uh, on each person we've mentioned this morning uh, and, and those we haven't m- mentioned out loud, the, the little secrets that we've kept from everybody else, but things that are very important to us nonetheless. Uh, we trust you, Father, to do what is right, to do what is best according to your schedule. Uh, we're grateful uh, to have a loving and powerful Father in heaven. I we ask this morning that we'd feel your presence here, that we'd be encouraged by the time we spend in worship, uh, the time we spend in your word. Uh, we are so grateful uh, for all the blessings that you've given to us, uh, the way that you reveal yourself to us each day. It's in the name of Christ Jesus we pray. Amen. <clears throat> If you are interested in giving an offering, um, there are multiple ways that you can do that, uh, either uh, in the offering boxes in the back, or you can give electronically in a number of ways um, through the website, through the Realm Connect app, um, through a link in the newsletter. Um, we, don't, we don't make anybody give. We're not going to twist your arm. We just say thank you uh, for how you're involved in our ministry because people like AICM uh, and their work uh, benefit uh, from uh, from those gifts as well. <clears throat> um, so there was a have been a few of you have said, "Well, I didn't know if you'd be here this morning, James." Nothing's happened yet, so I'm here. Um, just in case you didn't get the memo, uh, I'm having uh, open heart surgery tomorrow. I'm checking into the hospital today at three. So um, I, I may not be able to linger very long uh, around here. I have a little bit of packing and crises, things to take care of at home. But um, that is uh, that's coming up tomorrow. Uh, and with my absence, there will be obviously some gaps. And um, I'll just tell you right now, everything's going to be fine. It'll be fine. Uh, God, God has not brought us this far to let the church fall apart just because one guy is having surgery, okay? So he's going to be here. He's going to keep things moving, uh, and hopefully uh, you all will, will want to be a part of that. Um, back in January, I made a plan for all of the sermons for this year. I don't know if you've heard it or not, but it's true. We plan, and God laughs. Uh, That's kind of how I've felt about 2024. Um, There's been a lot of uh, divine laughter about my uh, my plans for for the year. Um, But I I planned out my sermons. Uh, I always want to make sure that we have a a big emphasis on the life, the teaching, the miracles, the characteristics of Jesus between Christmas and Easter. That seems like a really great spot to do that. Um, We had our people are the prize. What do we call that? campaign um, back several weeks ago. I, I knew that was going to be a, plan, a part of our year. Uh, I always include a family series, which we just finished up last week. Um, I, I always plan to preach through at least one book of the Bible uh, because the Olympics are going on this year. It's like, hey, we should do an Olympic series. So that'll start the end of July, beginning of August, as we all wear our berets and eat croissants. Uh, here on Sunday mornings um, to celebrate. It's the splash zone. Susan, do you want to test me? I didn't think so. Uh, Obviously, there's always four or five Christmas sermons, a a handful of other things um, that are important. Um, 
But, but I want to make sure that every year that I'm doing some teaching about our relationship to money and possessions. Because that's a big deal. Uh, we, it is a constant concern for all of us. Um, there's, there seems like there's never enough. And what we find as we read through the Gospels is that Jesus does talk a lot about money. I have not done the counting on my own to put everything in the categories that Jesus talks about, but I have been led to believe for all of my life that Jesus talks more about money than anything else. You ever heard that? I, I believe it's, it's true. Um, and I think that's because he knows it is such a concern for so many, whether they have a lot or they have a little. So in this next month, um, we're going to spend uh, five, ser- have five sermons looking at some of Jesus' lessons, specifically from the Sermon on the Mount, that deal with money, wealth, possessions, and finances. Um, that does not mean that you don't get to, s- you, you get to skip church, okay? You still need to come. I know everybody thinks that people only talk about money all the time at church. That's all we really care about. I don't really care about that. I care about my money, and I want to make sure that I handle it in a way that honors God, and I want you to handle your money in a way that honors God. Uh, I got an got a 11-year-old car, um, and uh, there is no Rolex anywhere close to me, and you can see this is the clearance rack at uh, at the store, all right? So I'm not worried about padding my pockets. That is not why I'm talking about money, okay? Um, now, we're going to talk about medical bills this year. That could be different, <laughs> but, um, but we're going to spend, uh, f- f- spend five weeks. I'm, I'm kicking it off and then hiding, uh, and um, three of the elders and one former elder are going to do the preaching over the next four weeks. I am hoping and praying to be back in the saddle the last Sunday in July. i got to have something to aim at. Um, if not, Terry Tedder said he would be glad to handle it for me. No, no worries at all. So, uh, actually, I believe it's going to be a death match between Cody and Terry. Uh, the loser had to preach. So, uh, anyway, that's, that's where we're headed. Um, the ser- oh, I didn't put the sermon slide in the thing, Shannon. I'm sorry. Um, but it is called Mastering Money. Uh, that'll be in there uh, for, uh, for next week. Um, what does Jesus say, Jesus the Master, tell us about mastering our finances and wealth? Uh, and I, I, th- this seemed like a really good idea at the outset of all this adventure. Uh, if I had to do it over again, I might choose differently. But I'm just going to ramble for a little bit and then be done. All right? Um, So, uh, if you have your Bible, and you'd like to turn to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. I'll I'll read a little bit of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. This morning, we are talking about worry. Uh, The title is Worry Warrior. Matthew chapter 6, verse, uh, we'll call that 25. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life. (laughs) Do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Isn't life more than food, and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They don't sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They don't labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon, in all of his splendor, was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So, don't worry, saying, what are we going to eat? Or what are we going to drink? Or what are we going to wear? For the pagans run after all these things. 
And your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be, at, will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And I'd throw in there, amen? Amen, amen exactly. Each day has enough trouble of its own. One of the things that I have said for, uh, for a very long time is that we don't want to borrow trouble. We're not going to look ahead and be uh, panicking and frantic about whatever could possibly happen. My wife has mislearned this. She says, I don't want to buy trouble. Absolutely, I don't want to buy trouble. I don't want to pay for it. It usually comes for free, okay? But we don't want to borrow trouble because every day has its own trouble. There, there's, there's plenty for June the 23rd, 2024, so we look through those, those two paragraphs from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Um, hopefully you heard it a number of times. Do not worry. Stop worrying. Why are you worrying? Maybe you are a big worrier. Maybe you really struggle with anxiety about not just money, but all kinds of things all day long. Vivian was a worrier. She worried about all kinds of things, but a big concern surrounded mealtimes. She worried that she wouldn't have the right things available. What if I don't have the things that people want? But there was always a stash of favorites. She worried that there wasn't enough food on the table. It was already full, and she kept it coming all the way through the meal. She would worry that the meal wouldn't taste right. And it couldn't have tasted any better. She worried that the guests wouldn't like it. And they always did. She just couldn't stop worrying. Unfounded fears anxiety, all the time. Her worry caused her to be distracted. It caused her to make mistakes, some of which were dangerous. She couldn't just relax. I don't know that she ever enjoyed the time that she had company in her home because most times she would even sit down at the table with those people that she was fretting about and hovering over. The relentless anxiety of a person like Vivian can take a, a physical toll as well. It, you go looking online for physical uh, consequences of worry or fear or anxiety, it's a great list. Nausea, stomach pain, digestion issues, headaches, insomnia, fatigue, weakness, muscle tension or pain, sweating, trembling or shaking, co a compromised immune system, shortness of breath, an increased heart rate and blood pressure. Sounds awesome, huh? Worry wasn't good for Vivian, and it isn't good for us either. Physically, mentally, or spiritually. Jesus says, stop worrying about, ironically, we call them the cares of life. Stop worrying about those things. The, the, the verb means, uh, in the original language, it's about being anxious, being troubled with cares, not being able to focus on anything else. You are fixated on on this thing. You just can't stop thinking about these factors of life. So imagine a football player whose focus is on the lines on the field, 
or um, the temperature of the Gatorade in the coolers or the size and the color of the coach's clipboard, the dress code of the fans, or the volume and song selection of the band, rather than the game that he's supposed to be playing and giving his all to. Or maybe a baker who fixates on the color and the pattern of her apron, the cords on the equipment, the font on the recipe card, and the music that's playing in the kitchen, rather than on the cake that's being baked. I ain't right. That's not, that's not the way that's supposed to work. They're distracted, unfocused, maybe even a little crazy. That's not how it's intended to be. Wherever we are, that's where we're supposed to be. Jesus says that when we we fixate on these cares of life, we can become a slave to those cares. Uncontrolled worry and unnecessary focus on material things will compel us to be an unwitting and unwilling servant to those material things. Unwitting means you didn't intend for it to happen. You're not aware that it's going on. You're, you're, you're not aware of it, but it's still true. Unwilling. You didn't aim for it to be that way, and you don't really want to, but it's like you, you really just can't stop because you have to keep this, this thing rolling. We will, we will make those things the central focus of our lives. We will pursue them. We will sacrifice for them. We know all sorts of people who have made terrible sacrifices, personally, for more and more and more and more. A little bit more, a lot more, some more, but more. At one point in his ministry, Jesus uh, was uh, coming back towards Jerusalem, and he spent uh, some time in Bethany. Um, He stopped to see uh, some friends there, Mary and Martha and Lazarus. And when he got there, there was this kerfluffle going on between the two sisters, between Mary and Martha. Martha really was upset about a lot of things going on. She's stirring this pot. She's baking this bread. She's ironing this tablecloth. She has all these things going on because the good teacher, the master, Jesus is here, and she wants everything to be right. While Mary is out there just spending time, chatting, listening to Jesus teach. She's all worried and frustrated and and anxious about, about hosting Jesus. And he says to her, Martha, 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 you are worried and upset. Same word as everything else, anxiety and and worry. You're worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed. Actually, just one. There are a lot of things, a lot of really good things that we can be distracted by. A lot of things that we can have concerns for, things that we end up being worried about. Again, not everything that uh, can hurt us spiritually is a bad thing. There's a lot of things we can be worried about, but really only one thing is needed. In another uh, place, in Luke chapter 8, Jesus is telling a story about uh, someone who is out sowing seeds. I don't know what they're, wheat or barley or oats or something. And the, the sower goes out and he s- scatters the seed onto the field. Some of it's good soil, some of it's rocky soil, some of it goes along the walking path, and some of it gets over in the, the corners into the weed patch into the, where the thorns are. Verse four, uh, 7 of chapter 8 in Luke says, Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up with it and choked the plants 
And then a paragraph later in verse 14, he explains it and says, the seed that fell among thorns stands for those who hear the good news, but as they go on their way, they are choked, strangled by life's worries, riches and pleasures, and they don't mature. Worries about this life will strangle the pursuit of the most important next life. Those worries will keep you and me from being focused where it really matters. Being focused on a relationship with God through Christ Jesus and eternity. It may not kill it, but it will keep it from ever developing. It'll be sick and weak and frail, and it won't take too much in that state to wipe us out. Elsewhere in Luke's gospel, Jesus says, Beware, take note, guard yourself that your hearts aren't weighed down with the worries or anxieties of life. That's Luke chapter 21, verse 34. Guard yourself that your hearts aren't weighed down with the worries of life. He goes on to explain that if you are concerned about the, the, the cares of life, the factors of life, then you'll be, you will be so fixated there that you forget to spend any time preparing for anything else, including and especially his return. He says that it's going to come down on you unexpectedly like a trap. <coughs> You'll be caught. Jesus makes sure that his hearers understand. Make no mistake, it is coming. Don't forget, as you're going through Every day, all the things that you must do, do not forget that there is a significant and eternal event ahead of you. Don't lose sight of that. Don't miss the forest for the trees. Don't be so concerned with the worries of life, the anxiety of life, the needs of everyday life, that you find yourself unprepared and, and unexpecting something that Jesus has promised is absolutely on its way. Again, in Luke chapter 2, uh, ch sorry, Luke chapter 12, Jesus uh, talks about possessions and wealth. He talks about worry, and he says, Do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out, a treasure in heaven that will never fail, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Don't be so concerned with all these things that are right in front of you. What does Jesus talk about earlier? Food, drink, clothing. We can throw in lots of other things. Transportation, shelter, etc. Do not be so fixated on them that you forget about what is most important and promised to occur. Because if this is where all of your attention, all of your energy, all of your effort is right here and this thing right in front of you, you can't see around it or past it, you won't be ready for the main thing. It'll show you that this is really the most important thing to you, not an eternity that's promised to those who are faithful. It becomes the focus. It becomes the God. It becomes the Lord and the Master. Instead of you mastering your money and wealth, it is mastering you. You're slave to it. If we do that, 
it also demonstrates a lack of trust in God. We'll talk about that a little bit more uh, next Sunday. Well, you all will. I'll be watching from bed someplace. But if, if we are so focused on things, we're constantly worrying, full of anxiety, it shows that we really don't trust a loving, powerful Father who's promised to take care of us. And not only does it have those physical consequences I mentioned a minute ago, but um, there are spiritual ones. Now, thankfully, there are remedies f- for that as well. In Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, Paul says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition. Your Bible might have supplication. With thanksgiving, present your requests to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Prayer and petition. Prayer and supplication. Asking God to supply what it is that you need. That is the preferred approach to life. Lord, this is what we are going to need. I, I will work. I will carry out my end of the bargain. By the sweat of your brow, you'll take care of your family. I'll do my part, but I am trusting you to provide what we need and when we need it. Prayer and supplication, relying on God, not worry and anxiety, which really is all about you, isn't it? You're relying on your own strength, your own abilities, your own smarts, your own looks, your own everything. So what if I'm not smart enough? What if I'm not strong enough? What if I don't have enough experience? What if I can't get the job that I want? What if I, what if I, what if I, what if I? That's worry and anxiety. Prayer and supplication is, Lord, this is what we need. I'm going to trust you to bring it. When we pray to God about these necessities of life, we don't just find those things which he has promised to provide. But Paul tells us here that we also find God's peace. And he says that that peace is, transcends all understanding. Maybe we don't understand exactly what that means. It means that it is better than. It is superior to what our minds can conceive of. It's better than anything that we can think up. We may not be able to figure out how it's all going to work out, but when we pray and petition God, His peace comes, and it's better than anything that our mind's understanding can come up with. And that peace also, uh, the word has to do with setting up guard, um, keeping, keeping watch. Um, but it also says in the original language that it's because of where you are. The peace of God will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. It's not a very good translation of what Paul was really trying to say. Let me put it like this. Um, I think that probably the biggest, strongest, scariest guys in movies that I have seen in a while are Dwayne The Rock Johnson and John Cena. I know there's other guys who are bigger and probably scarier, but uh, those are two guys I would want to have in my corner. Do you know how big Dwayne Johnson is? He's 6'5". I've been hanging out with 6'1 and 6'2 guys all week long, and they seem pretty big. 6'5 is even bigger than that. And he weighs 260 pounds. Beautiful haircut, by the way. He's been a professional wrestler. He's been a professional football player, college football player. He is one big, capable dude. 
If I go anywhere with Dwayne The Rock Johnson, you know who I'm scared of? Nobody. If I have him and or John Cena on the other side, who is 6'1", 250 pounds, I do not have a single fear at all. I will walk into the biggest, darkest, scariest store, neighborhood, whatever, because those guys are with me. They are guarding my heart and my mind in their presence. And that's what Paul says that we get to do. When we ask God for what it is that we need, he gives us what we need, and that peace of God guards our hearts, not in John, uh, not in John or Dwayne, but in Christ Jesus. We stand up right beside him, and because we're right beside him, he's, in our, he's got our six. We don't worry about anything. I can relax, finally. Jesus says, why are you worried about this? Why are you worried about clothes? Why are you worried about food? Why are you worried about drink? Look, God gives all those things to the birds and the skunks and the raccoons and the wildebeests and polar bears and everything else. He takes care of everything else in the planet, which are not eternal. Don't you think that he will take care of you, his child, who just happens to be eternal? Yes. He's going to take care, take care of it. No worries. Now, I'm not going to do anything crazy like sing Bobby McFerrin's song to you about don't worry, be happy, because that just seems really like a dumb choice today. <clears throat> but there is a song um, that I... I uh, learned and sang a long time ago uh, in, in college that seems like a great way to kind of wrap all this up. It's called All Your Anxiety by a man named Edward Henry Joy. It says, Is there a heart overbound by sorrow? Is there a life weighed down by care? Come to the cross, each burden bearing, all, of, all your anxiety Leave it there. No other friend so swift to help you. No other friend so quick to hear. No other place to leave your burden. No other one to hear your prayer. Come then at once. Delay no longer. Heed his entreaty, kind and sweet. You need not fear a disappointment. You shall find peace at the mercy seat. And the chorus says, <clears throat> all your anxiety, all your care, bring to the mercy seat. Leave it there. Never a burden he cannot bear. Never a friend like Jesus. Don't, don't worry. Because if you do, you become a servant, a slave, an unwitting worshiper to stuff. Peter says in 1 Peter 5, verse 7, cast all your anxiety on him, on God, because he cares for you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your unending concern for us. We think about all the ways that you have provided just what we need at just the right time. And whatever it is that we struggle with, whether it is finances, investments, possessions, control, health. There's so many different things, Lord, that we can have worry and anxiety over. We know that you love us and that we can trust you. So, Lord, would you, would you remind us this week, when we have that first little flash of worry or concern, when we have a little anxiety, 
that we will just stop, that we will talk to you, and through prayer, through a petition, that we would ask for you to supply what it is that we need. We need to just get up close to Jesus and trust that the biggest, strongest, m- most wise, most loving superhero is at our side. We thank you for loving us the way you do, for promising that you'll give us what we need when we need it. We pray, Lord, that if there are people who are really struggling with deep anxiety, Lord, that they would, this prayer is not a band-aid that'll fix everything, but they'd find some help, they'd talk to somebody, they would learn, um, with, with lots of conversations, lots of prayer, lots of thought uh, to really trust you and to trust uh, for you to take care of them. We love you. Uh, we love what you have done for us. We know you'll always be just like that. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Every Sunday, we remember the Lord's Supper. <clears throat> uh, the Lord's Supper is a meal that we, uh, we share in each week to remember what Jesus has done for us. It's open to everybody who counts themselves as a Christian. It's not just members of this church. Um, it's not my table. It's not the church's table. It's Jesus' table. Um, so I'll ask if uh, four men can come this morning and uh, begin to distribute the communion elements to the congregation here. If you're watching from home, if you'd make sure you have uh, yours as well, uh, yours as well to partake with us in just a moment. I want to share a uh, share an article uh, from the Christian Standard magazine. It's called Faith Time. Uh, The author says, in today's age of working remotely, one of the consequences of working under COVID, platforms like FaceTime, uh, Zoom, Teams, others like that, uh, FaceTime has become the standard means of digital communication. Its convenience has redefined, uh, redefined how business meetings are conducted making collaboration across the country and around the world possible. Family members can readily connect with each other, even though they are separated by thousands of miles. Of course, nothing beats face-to-face contact, especially within families. And such contact is what is at the heart of the term incarnation. It is not a word that's in the Bible. You You won't find it. But the concept is absolutely biblical. Incarnation means literally in flesh. And it describes how God, the Word, became flesh and John says made his dwelling among us. The Apostle John never lost his sense of wonder at what he and his fellow apostles were privileged to experience, which was face-to-face time with God in the flesh. This is clear from how the letter that we call 1 John begins, a letter that was most likely written when John was an old man and a seasoned veteran of faith. Uh, In verse 1, it says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at, and our hands have touched, that we proclaim concerning the word of life. For John... The face time with Jesus was as fresh in his mind as if it had happened just yesterday. At communion, our experience with Jesus is not a matter of face time, unfortunately, but rather faith time. We accept by faith what, God, uh, what John and the other gospel writers proclaimed about Jesus. This includes uh, Jesus' words, Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. At communion, we acknowledge by faith that Jesus' death was for our sins, which Paul affirms is of first 
importance in 1 Corinthians 15, 3. We also look forward to Jesus' return. For on that great day, our faith time with Jesus will be transformed into face time. When we see him as he is. That face time will include seeing people like John, along with members of the great cloud of witnesses, and so many faithful servants of the Lord, whose faces we have missed seeing since they left this world. Together, we will all meet in the true upper room of heaven and share in the wedding supper of the Lamb. And we will have a forever face time. Let's pray. Lord, we are grateful for this promise. As we go through this life, we have great faith that you are real, that you keep your promises just as you always have, and that someday we will see you face to face, and and that which has been only faith will then become sight. It will become reality. Lord, we look forward to that day. We're grateful for uh, for this reminder that we have each week of the great love that you have for us and your desire to have us in your presence for eternity. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. In Luke 22, verse 19, it says, Jesus took bread, he gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, Jesus took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Paul says that when we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. We're very glad that you could be here with us this morning. We look forward to seeing you all again very soon, whether it's here or online. We know you're checking us out online. Come and see us in reality. We're really okay. It'll be fine. Uh, I would like to close with um, with a benediction uh, that was given uh, for the people of Israel to Moses from the Lord, where he says, May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace. Amen. Amen. Thank you for being with us this morning.